Okay, guys, so today we have a new series of very important lectures devoted to a very important topic called geometric deep learning, how to deal with various geometric shapes, lighter data, and other things. Michael Bronstein, please. Thank you. So uh, I guess it's late hour and I'm holding you here for the next hour and a half. So apologies for that. I'm really glad to be here. Actually, my first time at Skoltech. And uh, thanks, Evgeny, and all the organizers for the, this uh, kind invitation here. So uh, today I would like to talk about what we call geometric deep learning. Uh, basically, it's uh, how to extend deep learning methods to non-Euclidean structured data, in particular graphs, manifolds, point clouds, meshes, and, uh, and so on. So today I will try to cover the basics, basically all the mathematical background that you need for it, and focus primarily on graphs, and tomorrow it will be more about geometric objects. Uh, uh, manifolds, uh, point clouds, and meshes. Is there some issue? Yeah. Uh, so, some noise. Can you hear me? Where should I stand not to see, not hear the buzzing? I will try to. I don't know. Let me put it here. Is it better? I will not touch anything, I will try to stand still not to move. Okay, so uh, basically you, you all know, I think you all heard about uh, deep learning, right? So I don't need to convince you that this is an important field. And uh, uh, basically in computer vision it has created de facto a revolution in the past decade or so. Uh, for example, in the famous uh, ImageNet uh, benchmark, it already achieves performance that is better than human. And uh, if you look at the uh, research, uh, how computer vision changed, basically traditional computer vision usually started with some handcrafted features that were extracted from an image using some uh, hardwired or hand-engineered uh, feature descriptor, whether it's uh, SIFT or surf, SURF. Maybe many of you even don't know what it is, but it was a very popular method, one of the most cited uh, papers in computer science. And then after you extract these features, you would apply some standard classifier such as support vector machine to, for example, to tell that this is a car. With deep learning, basically, you uh, try to solve this task end to end to extract features that are optimal for the specific task. If you want to recognize if you uh, try to tell apart different car makes, for example, uh, you will need maybe uh, something else. So uh, basically, this ability to learn uh, task-specific features was one of the important uh, success points of, uh, of deep learning. Now, uh, basically this is uh, how the architectures uh, that started this trend looked like. And uh, uh, 2012, the famous paper by Krzyzewski and Kosras basically started this, uh, this trend. Nowadays, all computer vision is uh, based on, uh, on deep learning. There is some controversial claim that actually data is more important than, uh, than algorithms. Uh, if you look at the uh, time that it takes from the introduction of an algorithm to certain breakthrough in uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, maybe in a broader sense, uh, then you see that on average it takes about 18 years from the introduction of the algorithm and about three years uh, from the introduction of the data set. You can say that this is a little bit selective uh, presentation and uh, it's maybe a little bit in the eyes of the beholder, but probably there is at least some truth in it. So in case of computer vision, it was the ImageNet uh, uh, data set. Now, if you look at the main focus of research in this field of machine learning, it has primarily focused on what we can call Euclidean data, basically data with underlying grid structure. So uh, acoustic signals, text, uh, images, you can think of them as uh, data living on a one or two dimensional grid. In case of uh, data with different structures, such as social networks, uh, graphs that describe molecules, functional networks in brain imaging, uh, 
three-dimensional objects, uh, shapes, manifolds, point clouds. We don't have this underlying structure. So basically the question of genetic deep learning is how to deal with data with, without underlying grid structure, with graphs, manifolds, and so on. And that's exactly the topic of this tutorial. So uh, we'll be dealing with deep learning on graphs and manifolds. And the name geometric deep learning, basically we invented this term in our review paper back in 2016 approximately. It has caught up at least in some communities. Uh, basically it is an umbrella term for graph neural networks, uh, uh, neural networks on meshes, uh, on point clouds and so on. And actually, uh, we had a quite successful uh, tutorial at uh, New Rips in 2017. It was attended by, I think, at least 2,000 people. You can see the crowd uh, that attended the tutorial there. And it, it's Sean Bruna uh, speaking. And that was a horrible room with a lot of echo. And uh, there are even faculty positions in geometric machine learning. Uh, this particular example is from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so it seems to be quite a vibrant field that is growing very fast and there is a lot of interesting works that appear uh, uh, in this field. Now, we can also see some success stories. Basically, these methods are not completely exotic. You can apply them to a lot of problems and you can imagine that graphs are essentially ubiquitous. You can model practically any system of relations or interactions between things uh, as a graph. And therefore, you can learn on these graphs so you can apply uh, deep learning on graphs uh, to problems such as recommender systems. Uh, you can apply it in uh, high energy physics. You can model interactions between particles as, as graphs as well. Uh, you can apply it to social media. So, for example, uh, detecting fake news on, uh, on social networks. Uh, applications in chemistry, uh, drug repositioning, drug design, and so on and so forth. So I will touch upon some of these applications, but you can also, you can also find many of them yourself. Let me show you a few examples of different classes of problems and you can also see similarities and maybe differences from the more familiar problems that you see in, uh, let's say, in image analysis. So imagine that you are given a graph, let's say the graph describes a molecule. So the nodes are atoms and the uh, edges represent chemical bonds. And here we try to predict some vector of properties of this molecule. For example, whether it's soluble in water or whether it's toxic or whether it's uh, efficient against some disease. So basically we gather some features that might live on this graph and we try to produce a vector that describes the entire graph. So if you make an analogy to computer vision problems, that's like taking an image and telling whether there is a cat object inside or not, right? So basically it's graph-wise uh, classification. You can also think of problems where you uh, are given a graph, let's say social network with different users. You have some node-wise features, let's say representing gender, education background, workplace, uh, I don't know, age of the person, and you uh, maybe know a few labels for some of the vertices, you try to predict the rest of the labels. For example, you try to predict how the users would vote in the, let's say, in the next elections in the US, right? So, very important problem. And if you make, it, again, an analogy to computer vision uh, applications, uh, this is like semantic segmentation. You want to label each pixel in your image uh, according to what kind of object uh, it belongs to, okay? Now we can also here distinguish between different cases. So this is where probably the analogy with the Euclidean case ends. And uh, we can distinguish between the case where the domain is given. So if you take the social network, uh, at least at some point of time, you can fix the graph and say that this is my social network versus the case where you don't know the social network or uh, you basically, you may learn on one instance of the social network and then try to apply your model to a social network that has evolved after a certain amount of time. So in computer graphics and computer vision, uh, this is a typical situation where you have different shapes of, say, like, let's say, humans. You learn your model on uh, a certain set of people, and now you try to apply this model to another set of people that you've never seen before, right? So basically, these domains will model these shapes as, as manifolds will be new, never seen before. Okay, and finally, the case of, uh, 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 case of known versus unknown. So you might uh, think of the problem where you actually don't know the underlying graph. You might have some guess for it. Think of protein-to-protein -protein interaction networks. So we don't know actually all the interactions between, between proteins. We might know some of them. So you may also want to infer the graph together with maybe some filters that you will be learning on this graph. 
Okay, so I will start today with a very brief introduction, then I will uh, spend some time on defining spectral analysis on graphs, so that will be our battle horse. We will be using this uh, uh, in this uh, tutorial, and also you will see some overlap with what Justin is presenting. Uh, basically, uh, our key uh, Swiss knife, so, so to say, will be the Laplacian operator in different flavors. We'll see it on graphs, we'll see it on meshes, you can also see it on Euclidean data. Then we'll be talking about spectral approaches for defining convolutions on graphs and uh, many different applications. Okay, and tomorrow we'll be primarily devoted to three-dimensional data, to problems in computer vision and graphics. So let me just remind you briefly, basically, about deep learning, so you, you might know uh, uh, this field much better than myself, just to remind you that actually uh, deep learning is not very deep in the sense that there is this result called the universal approximation theorem that tells you that basically a, a class of functions that can be realized as a neural network with one hidden layer is dense in the uh, set of continuous functions. So basically you can uh, represent with any accuracy any continuous function to, uh, uh, by uh, a neural network with just one hidden layer, right? So. Basically, it means that neural networks are universal approximators, and uh, in theory, you can train them to learn anything, right? Now, this is on the positive side. On the negative side, this result doesn't tell you how many neurons you will need in such a neural network, how to find, actually, the parameters uh, such that the network learns this given function. Uh, does it generalize well, or does it overfit? And uh, Basically, you can uh, very quickly discover that if you try to apply these kind of neural networks to high dimensional data, it doesn't work. And the reason for it is what is uh, usually called the curse of dimensionality. So there are many ways of uh, thinking of it. Uh, here is one uh, geometric visualization of what is called the curse of dimensionality. So if you take uh, a unit, uh, unit sphere of different dimensions and inscribe it into a unit, uh, unit square, and you look at the, uh, at the volume of this, unit, uh, of this unit sphere, you will see that very quickly it will go to zero as the dimensionality grows. So you see that, for example, the volume for two-dimensional case is about uh, 0.7, for uh, three-dimensional case it's already 0.52, and for 10-dimensional case it's 10 to minus three, right? And you see that uh, it, it goes to zero very fast. So if you thought of a very naive classifier that just assigns uh, nearest neighbors within some epsilon neighborhood that will be exactly the red ball uh, to the given class or the center of the, of the ball, some representative sample, you will see that in high dimension, basically, uh, everything will be dominated by the outside of this ball. So you will need uh, a lot of examples in order to make such a thing work. And uh, that's why, uh, for example, for these shallow neural networks, the number of training samples will grow exponentially in the dimension. So you will need uh, probably uh, absolutely impossible number of examples to train such neural networks. So the, the trick actually and the success story of deep learning is how to make use of data structure, how to make use of redundancy. And if we take on images, look at, at images, uh, you see that uh, images are repetitive. They're repetitive across the image, they're repetitive across scales. So uh, you can think of natural images as uh, fractal structures. You see, for example, that what was shown here by, by similar colors are basically similar patches that appear in images. And we know that, for example, if we look at, uh, at uh, uh, neuroscientists look at the, the way that the, the visual cortex is connected, uh, basically the uh, operations that the visual cortex performs are local. The famous experience of Hubel and Wiesel that uh, brought them the Nobel Prize in medicine and the first incarnation of these ideas in the prototype precursors of uh, convolutional neural networks by Fukushima. So basically that is the basis for convolutional neural networks that now are battle horse of computer vision. Basically they employ uh, convolutional filters uh, to share weights across the image. So this way uh, you, uh, uh, you reduce dramatically the number of weights. You have translation uh, equivariance. You, you capture self-similarity. You can apply multiple layers so you have uh, compositional features and uh, the filters are localized. So in terms of uh, computation, it's very important that the number of parameters is independent on the input size, so you can train the model once and apply it to images of practically any size. The computational complexity is linear, you just pass a window or maybe multiple windows over the image, so it's uh, uh, order of n. Uh, 
and we'll try to reproduce uh, these uh, properties uh, for graphs and manifolds. Okay, so with this, uh, basically, if we look at this picture, uh, we started with fully connected networks, right? Basically with uh, just a single hidden layer per spectron. We see that it's infeasible to apply to images. If you uh, then make uh, use of redundancy in images, the, 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 that was exactly the success of convolutional neural networks, we'll try to generalize these notions. So there, uh, there is a beautiful line of works from the group of Max Welling that tries to uh, uh, generalize it to uh, general group operations on uh, homogeneous spaces such as rotations. Uh, and uh, talking about manifolds, we'll uh, try to generalize it to invariance to uh, deformations. Okay, so let's do a little bit of math. I will uh, probably remind you uh, some very basic notions that you probably know from first year of your, of, your, uh, of your undergraduate studies. Nevertheless, it will be important to refresh them maybe from slightly different perspectives so then we can uh, reproduce the same notions for graphs. Okay, so I will start with uh, basic notions in vector calculus. And uh, imagine that you are given a scalar function. So for simplicity, think of temperature in this room. Right? It probably will vary in the room. Probably some places will be uh, warmer, let's say close to the windows, and some places will be, will be colder. And uh, we can compute the gradient of this function. So the gradient, you can think of it as basically as a field of arrows, right? So the, at each point, the arrow will point in the direction of the steepest increase of the function, right? So this is how it is visualized. So you see that basically it uh, goes, let's say, into sinks and uh, flows outside of uh, of sources, we can define uh, divergence. So given a vector field like the gradient, divergence is the density of a flux of something, right? So you can basically see how much uh, error is going in or going out, okay? And there is a famous result that is called divergence theorem. It has many names in, in different fields. Basically, it tells you that some kind of conservation, right? So if you sum up all the sources and the sinks, you will get the net flow uh, through some volume, okay? And basically, what is the Laplacian, the Laplacian operator? Uh, it is defined as the divergence of the gradient. And uh, geometrically, you can think of it as the difference between the value of a function at the point and the average of the value of the function in infinitesimal neighborhood around this point, okay? On a tiny sphere that goes to, uh, with a radius that goes to zero, okay? You can actually show it uh, by consequence of the divergence theorem in the notes that you should should have received uh, the reason proof. So you're welcome to, to check it. If we discretize the Laplacian, we also see the, the, uh, the familiar notion. In one dimension, it's just a central difference. In two dimension, you can see that you can compute it with uh, four neighbors on, uh, on the discrete grid. And basically, uh, this need to compute the difference between your own value and the value of the surrounding is ubiquitous. Uh, you will encounter Lapla Laplacian practically in every field of mathematical physics. And I will give you just two examples of uh, partial differential equations where it appears. One is the heat equation. We'll uh, devote most attention to it tomorrow. So basically what it represents is a differential form of uh, the Newton's law of cooling, which tells you that the rate of change of a temperature of an object is proportional to the difference between its own temperature and the temperature of the surrounding. So the rate of change of the temperature, in this case, F models temperature at certain temporal and spatial coordinate. So that's the temporal derivative, that's the right-hand side. And the left-hand side, sorry, that's the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is the difference between, uh, uh, between own and uh, surrounding temperature uh, in the differential form, right? So that's the Laplacian operator. And the proportion coefficient is called the thermal diffusivity constant in physics, right? So that's the simplest isotropic heat equation. Uh, this is the wave equation, so similar idea. It models, uh, basically, uh, propagation of wave as a system of masses connected by springs. So basically, essentially, it's a differential form of the Newton's uh, second law, okay? So that's what you need to know about calculus. Let's see how we implement it on graphs, okay? So for the graphs, we'll consider graphs with a set of n vertices and uh, edges connecting them. And for simplicity, consider graphs that are undirected meaning that uh, edges go both ways, okay? So basically these are unordered pairs of vertices. And we attach some uh, non-negative, uh, actually strictly positive weights to each 
vertex, and we attach some non-negative weights to the edges. Okay. Again, this this is just to make it simple. You can make it infinitely more complicated. You can uh, decorate the edges and the vertices with any features you want. Uh, but this is just to make it mathematically easy to easy to handle. And uh, we can think of uh, vertex fields. Basically, these are functions defined on vertices. Okay, so I have uh, some temperature at each vertex of the graph. Imagine a network of sensors that measures temperature in a city. Okay, and they communicate to each other along edges. So that would be a situation that is depicted here. So we can also uh, define edge fields. Basically, these will be functions living on the edges of the graph, and uh, we'll assume implicitly that the edge fields are alternating. F i j equals to minus f j i. Okay, again to make things uh, simple mathematically. So we can define uh, a vector space, inner product space, with uh, standard inner products. Basically, you can think of these uh, uh, these functions as vectors, n-dimensional vectors, or vectors of dimensionality equal to the number of edges, and uh, these will be just simple weighted uh, inner products. Okay. Now, what is the gradient operator on the graph? Basically, for each pair of vertices that are connected by an edge, you just take the difference between. Uh, the values of function at these, uh, at these vertices, okay, and you get uh, basically a function that is defined on the edges, right? So basically, if you think of it as an operator, the gradient operator takes uh, take, takes vertex fields and makes of them edge fields, okay? So basically, it starts with a signal that lives on the vertices and uh, it produces a signal that lives on the edges. We can same way define the divergence operator that takes signals that live on the edges, and basically it sums up uh, the signals on the edges that share a common vertex, okay? And the result will be a signal that lives on the vertices of the graph, okay? So that's the divergence. So it is very similar to what we've seen in the Euclidean case. It's now just defined on the graph, okay? What can we say about these operators? They're a joint, formally a joint. Basically, you can move them with the inner product, you pay attention that the inner products are different. So the first inner product is an inner product on the, uh, on the space of functions living on the edges. The second one is functions living on the vertices. Yeah. So AI is the weight of the vertices, yes. That's why we assume that it's uh, strictly positive. So the weights, well, here they assume that they are given. So these are properties of the graph, right? So the graph is weighted. You have some weight attached to the vertices and the edges. Not necessarily. So you can define the uh, you can define a to be the degree. So when you discretize a manifold, for example, that will be some volume element. So it's it's really flexible. So here it's just just assume to be, so you can think of it also as, as basically as a measure, right? So a discrete measure, so that, that basically volume element. Right? In the inner product, basically you can think of it as discretization of an integral. Yeah. Strictly positive. Yeah. The, uh, the vertex weights. The edge weights can be negative, it can be zero. Right? Simplifying is, see that you can make it uh, more or less anything you want. Okay, not necessarily scalar. Okay, so the Laplacian, as we've seen before, we define it as the divergence of the gradient, right? So basically, it's an operator that takes uh, vertex uh, 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 vertex fields and produces vertex fields, right? And what it does essentially, it does exactly this geometric operation of averaging, basically producing a weighted average of the neighbors and subtracting it from the value of the vertex, right? So basically, I will be looking at all the FJs that are connected to FI, summing them up, and subtracting from FI, right? So the general form you can write the Laplacian is this. You can easily, by some massage of the formula, you can see that uh, it's exactly what, uh, what I'm saying. And you can write it as, uh, basically, as a matrix vector product. You can represent it as an n by n matrix that will usually be sparse. It will encode the connectivity of the graph. Basically, matrix W will contain the edge weights if there is an edge, it will be zero if there is no edge, and A will be a diagonal matrix that encodes the, the, the vertex weights, okay? And D here denotes the degree matrix, also a diagonal matrix, okay? Uh, 
and there is a plethora of different Laplacian operators, so it's actually not do Laplacian, it's a Laplacian. Basically, you can define it in different ways. Uh, you can define it as an unnormalized Laplacian. You can define it as random walk Laplacian, so you can think of it as a transition probability of random walk on a graph. You can define a normalized symmetric Laplacian, basically changing coordinates so the, this, uh, this matrix is symmetric, and so on and so forth. So uh, they have slightly different properties. Uh, for our discussion, this is not important, but once you uh, implement, pay attention to that, that it might actually matter in some cases. Okay, so what can we do with the Laplacian? Basically, we can use the Laplacian to define uh, what is called uh, the Dirichlet energy. Basically, it measures the smoothness of the signal on the graph, right? Basically, you tell how much you are different from your neighbors. So, uh, the quadratic form that is defined by the Laplacian essentially tells me whether I'm very, very different from my neighbors or I'm not, right? So, if the signal is constant, then Dirichlet energy will be zero. If it uh, changes very rapidly when I move from uh, a vertex to another vertex along an edge, then the Dirichlet energy will be large. So uh, we can do it for basically for a family of factors. I can write it as sum of Dirichlet energies, right? So it will be this trace of uh, phi transpose uh, uh, delta phi. Phi here denotes a matrix containing uh, vectors as columns. So basically these are vertex uh, fields. Right, and this matrix is orthogonal. So I'm looking for an orthogonal basis that is the smoothest in the sense of this uh, Dirichlet energy. Okay. Now, the solution is given by the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. You probably have seen it already, uh, maybe with Justin when he was talking about manifold optimization. So this is uh, actually a classical example of uh, 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 Stiefel constraint optimization, right? It, it has a closed form solution in this case. You can write it as, uh, as eigen decomposition of the Laplacian. Our Laplacian is defined to be positive semi-definite, so the eigenvalues will be non-negative and the eigenvectors will be orthogonal. Okay, so it's a symmetric matrix, it has, uh, it has nice properties. So we can regard this as an orthogonal basis. I will already anticipate it will replace the Fourier transform. You can do Fourier decomposition in this orthogonal basis. Okay, so it is generalization of the standard uh, sine or cosine basis, or the Fourier basis in the Euclidean uh, analysis, right? You can actually see that sines or cosines are the smoothest uh, uh, functions with respect to the uh, Euclidean Laplacian, right? And on general graphs, it will be something else. It will be uh, something that looks like this. So the first eigenvector will be constant. The corresponding eigenvalue is zero. So you can think of it as uh, the zero frequency or the DC uh, component and as you go to higher eigenvalues you will see uh, eigenvectors with increasing oscillations so again think of them uh, uh, think of eigenvalues as frequencies and eigenvectors as corresponding uh, basis functions in free analysis okay we'll talk slightly more details uh, when we talk about manifolds we'll see some more physical intuition of this okay so let me now you remind you what is convolution right so that's the, basically that's the basic building block of convolutional neural networks. So we'll uh, now need to generalize it to graphs. And usually your, uh, yeah. How it pops out from the construction of the Laplacian? Well, you can, you can show it. So it is, uh, uh, basically there are several properties usually that you want to satisfy, the continuous Laplacian satisfies. So it is, uh, it is positive, uh, positive semi-definite, right? Why it is positive semi-definite? Because uh, the sum of uh, uh, rows and columns uh, is zero. So it has a, a constant eigenvector with eigenvalue zero, right? If you multiply the Laplacian, if you mu multiply a constant vector by the Laplacian, you will get a zero, right? And that's exactly a constant function that has zero Dirichlet energy, right? So that's why it's uh, positive semi-definite, it's not positive definite. But you can show that it's uh, that it's uh, positive, uh, positive uh, semi-definite as well. It's not it's, uh, it's not difficult. Okay, so uh, when I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, derivation of convolution, where actually it comes from. Usually you are given a formula and maybe get some a little bit of geometric intuition. But I would like to make to make it more interesting. I would try to define it in a way that basically it will emerge itself from certain invariance properties. Okay, which is probably much nicer, right? So for this purpose, we consider a Euclidean case. Uh, 
we consider uh, uh, basically vectors that are uh, flanks n and defined uh, mod n. So think of a signal defined on a circle. Okay, basically it wraps around. So we'll be talking about circle convolutions just for simplicity, not to deal with boundary, uh, not to deal with uh, boundary conditions. Uh, what is a circle and matrix? You take such a vector and you produce a matrix which contains shifted versions of the vector. Each row is a shifted version of the of the previous row by one position. Okay, and again you wrap around, so you get a matrix that has these diagonal structures. Okay, and you have an explicit uh, formula for this. Right, so basically, uh, circle and matrices uh, describe circle convolutions. So you can uh, describe convolution as multiplication of a vector by such a matrix. Right. Now, a particular case of a circular matrix is a, a shift operator. We denote the right and left shift by S and S transpose. Basically, it shifts the position of uh, the vector by one, either to the left or to the right. Again, with wraparound. Okay. It is equivalent, as you can easily see by uh, equivalent to multiplication by uh, one of these matrices. Okay? And again, we have explicit expression for the elements of this matrix. Now, we can see that basically a matrix is circulant if and only if it commutes with shift. Right? So this could be a definition of a circulant matrix. And basically, it, it, it means that convolution can be defined axiomatically as an operation that commutes with shift. Right? Now, we also know that convolution is a linear shift uh, equivariant operation. Basically, I can exchange between convolution and shift, right? So if I first shift the signal and then convolve, or if I first convolve and then shift, I will get the same result. So in signal processing, sometimes this is called shift invariance. So this is not correct term. Don't confuse invariance. Invariance would mean that CS equals CF, right? So that the result doesn't change as a result of shift, right? So the correct term is uh, shift equivariance shift covariance. Basically, it changes in the same way with the shift operator. Okay? Now, what can we say about the eigenvectors of commuting matrices? So, this is also a result, a classical result from linear algebra. Uh, two matrices are jointly diagonalizable, meaning that they have the same eigenspaces, or in this case, it will be same eigenvectors, if and only if they commute, right? So, basically, what we know previously that we can define by, uh, commut by commutativity uh, the uh, uh, convolution operation, right? So we expect the convolution operation to be diagonalized by eigenvectors of the shift operator, right? So now the question is how do the eigenvectors of the shift operator look like? And this is a very simple matrix, so we can actually uh, derive it very easily. Again, in the notes you can find, uh, you can find the derivation, but the bottom line, the eigenvalues of these matrix are complex. Basically, they are, uh, uh, they are roots of, uh, of unity. Uh, and the eigenvectors are uh, the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, okay? Which is defined in this way, defined it with normalization of one over the square root of n. And in the Euclidean case, it can be computed efficiently in n log n complexity using fast Fourier transform algorithm, okay? Now, Basically, these are the eigenvectors, so we expect a, uh, a convolution operator, a circulant matrix, to have the same eigenvectors, basically, to have the DFT, the, the, the Fourier matrix as its eigenvectors. What about its eigenvalues? So it appears that the eigenvalues of a circulant matrix are the Fourier transform of the vector that forms it. Okay, so phi star here with a complex conjugate, so it's phi transpose conjugate F. Okay, and basically this gives a recipe of how to apply a filter, how to compute convolution efficiently, this is bread and butter of uh, signal processing. Basically, you compute the uh, forward Fourier transform of your signal using F of T and N log N. Then you apply the filter in the spectral domain, basically by multiplying the Fourier transform of the signal by the Fourier transform of the filter. And usually the filter is already designed in the frequency domain. So you don't actually need to compute the second Fourier transform. Then after you computed this uh, pointwise product, which costs you order of N, you compute the inverse Fourier transform, right? And this costs you again n log n. So bottom line, n log n operations to compute filter. Okay. Now you can think of the Laplacian that we've seen before. So this is how the Euclidean Laplacian looks like. It is also a circulant matrix, right? So it is also diagonalized by, by DFT. So in the Euclidean case, basically they're all equivalent. The Laplacian, the shift operator. So you can actually axiomatically 
define convolutions as element-wise products in the Laplacian Leigh basis. Okay? So that's exactly what we can define on graphs. On graphs, we don't have shift operations. We cannot add or subtract vertices of the graph. We can add or subtract uh, functions on the vertices of the graph, but not vertices. So basically, shift is not well defined on a graph, right? But you can define a construction like this, right? So that's how we can define convolution on a graph, and that's exactly what we'll be doing now, okay? Any questions on this? So basically now we have a recipe of how to define a spectral convolution on the graph. And that's exactly uh, using the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. In this case, it will be the graph Laplacian that we defined before. So basically spectral convolution can be defined like this. Phi now are, is the matrix of eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. So we take our signal, we compute its graph Fourier transform, we multiply then the result pointwise by the Fourier coefficients of the filter, g, g hat, right? And then compute the inverse Fourier transform multiplying by the matrix phi, okay? So that's the conceptual recipe. Now, is it a good recipe? It's not a good recipe, right? Everything is actually bad about it. First of all, the computation of the Fourier transform, basically this multiplication by phi uh, transpose or by phi costs your order of n squared. It's a dense matrix you don't have f of t on graphs, right? Before it costs us uh, order of n log n, here it costs uh, full matrix multiplication. The pre-computation of these eigenvectors, basically eigen decomposition of the Laplacian, will have typically complexity that is almost order of n cube, right? So this is prohibitive for large graphs. Third thing is that if you look at the number of parameters of the filter here, these g hats, it's order of n. It scales linearly with the size of the graph, and in the classical setting, we wanted something that is order of one, right? So it is also bad. The filters are basis dependent. So if I compute the Laplacian on one graph, I compute the uh, Fourier transform, basically this matrix phi on one graph. I compute the filters with respect to these bases. And now I change the underlying graph. Everything will be screwed up. I will show you an example tomorrow when we talk about manifolds. But basically it means that the coefficients that you define on one graph uh, will not work on another graph, okay? Here, another thing that we cannot handle undirected graphs. So we explicitly assume that the graph is undirected in order to have the Laplacian symmetric matrix, which has orthogonal in the composition, right? So basically this spectral construction will not work if the graph is directed. And finally, that's the cherry on the pie. The uh, filters are not spatially localized. Basically, we are designing the filters in the frequency domain, who knows how they look like on the graph? Most likely they are not local, okay? And if that's not enough, the, the kind of filters that uh, you can get with this kind of construction are only isotropic. And when I'm talking about isotropic, meaning that they do, uh, are not sensitive to direction. So if I think of a two-dimensional grid graph, they will look like this. They will have radial symmetry. And again, look up the notes for proof that Laplacian is uh, invariant to the rotations, okay? So if I told you in computer vision, in image analysis applications, that this is the kind of filters you're allowed to use, probably you will tell me that this is not interesting, right? So we can do slightly better on graphs. We can do much better on manifolds. Okay, we have more structure. Okay, so that was a bad recipe. It was a good direction, but uh, not a good recipe. So we want something more efficient. And basically, a slightly different way of thinking of filters on graphs is thinking of them as a transfer function that is applied to the Laplacian spectrum, to the Laplacian eigenvalue. Remember that we can think of the eigenvalues as the frequencies in classical free analysis. So again, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more, we'll give slightly more uh, physical intuition to it. But basically we're applying some function to these eigenvalues. That's exactly when we are talking about a filter, that's what we do, right? And this function can be anything we want, right? It can be parametric, it can have a small number of parameters, it can be smooth. We'll see that it, it has to do with localization. Uh, so that's how we want uh, to model it. And basically, when we say that we apply a matrix, uh, uh, this function to a matrix, it means that we apply it to the spectrum of the matrix, right? So it's understood in the operator sense, right? It's like the matrix exponential. You don't exponentiate each element, you exponentiate the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? Now, if I can express this filter function in terms of simple matrix operations, like matrix vector products, powers, maybe inverses, then I actually don't need to compute the eigenvectors explicitly, right? 
So I don't need uh, to compute and multiply by this matrix phi, so it will imply that I can efficiently apply this filter, okay? In, actually, in order of n. Uh, as I said, this uh, filter function can be a, a parametric function with fixed number of parameters, and uh, therefore the number of uh, parameters for, for the filter will be all one, like uh, in the classical case. We can show that the filter results are stable under perturbations. So basically, change of the basis, uh, change of the underlying graph will not screw up the results. It is possible to guarantee spatial localization. Actually, we can say that the filter is compactly supported, or at least we can say that it decays uh, sufficiently fast. We can prove some form of exponential decay for certain filters. And let's see the first example of such filter. The, probably the most intuitive choice for this filter function is a polynomial. So we have polynomial of degree r, right? So you, you have uh, r plus one coefficients. These coefficients theta that parameterize the filter, and you see that when you apply it to a matrix, essentially you don't need to do any eigenecomposition because you need to just take powers of the Laplacian, right? Which automatically guarantees that your filter is localized, right? Laplacian is a local operator; it touches only the neighbors. If I take square of the Laplacian, it touches the neighbors of the neighbors, right? If I take the power r of the Laplacian, it touches neighbors r time removed, right? So basically, it affects only r hops on the graph. Okay, so that's why it has r hop support. And how do I apply it to a signal? Basically, I just multiply uh, my signal by, uh, by the powers of the Laplacian, right? And this is usually a sparse matrix. If we assume that the graph is sparsely connected, it will cost me order of n uh, operations, right? So it is efficient filter. It has fixed number of uh, coefficients. It can, in principle, apply to directed graphs, right? Though the spectral interpretation will be lost, but I can multiply my signal by any matrix I want. It doesn't need to be symmetric, okay? And there might be some technical issues related to how we scale this Laplacian. Uh, we want, for stability, we want to uh, normalize the eigenvalues, so they're in the range between minus one and plus one. But I don't want to uh, delve into these uh, technical details. Okay, let's see, uh, uh, let's look at this graph. So this is a graph that contains 15 communities. So this is actually a typical situation you observe in, let's say, social networks. People uh, of similar, let's say, tastes or similar interests or similar background t t tend to connect to each other more. So you will see in such a, uh, such a social network some kind of uh, uh, preferential attachment. So you will see that uh, uh, there are more links between, uh, uh, between uh, vertices of the same color and less links between vertices of different colors. Right? So if I look at the spectrum of this, uh, of this of Laplacian, of the Laplacian of this graph, I will see uh, a, a cluster of small eigenvalues close to zero, and then there will, will be a spectral gap and some higher eigenvalues, right? So if these components were completely disconnected, I will get uh, eigenvalue zero with multiplicity equal to the number of connected components, right? I could basically decompose this graph into multiple uh, independent graphs, right, and diagonalize each of the Laplacian separately. Think of how spectral clustering works, essentially, right? Here they are connected, so the eigenvalues are not exactly zero. Only the first one is zero, all the rest are slightly, slightly greater than zero, right? But if I were to solve the task, let's say, of uh, community detection on this graph, what I really care about is these 15 first eigenvalues. All the rest is noise, right? Now, if I look at my filters, the polynomial filters I've seen before, this is a visualization of the, of the filter function. Uh, the vertical bar, uh, bars represent the frequencies, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, and you see that I want to get these, uh, these uh, lower part of the spectrum, the dark frequencies, right? I don't care about the, the light frequencies. I hope you can see. Well, yeah, you can see. So it is very hard to localize polynomial filters on these, uh, on these low frequencies. You will need polynomials of very high degrees. They will be numerically unstable. So we want something else, and this something else could be rational filters. So if you're familiar with uh, signal processing terminology, we want uh, infinite impulse response filters as opposed to finite impulse response filters. Okay? What we've seen before, the polynomial filters are finite impulse response filters. Uh, infinite impulse response filters uh, are possible with uh, adding inversions into our simple matrix operations. And there are many ways of doing it. One way of doing it is by uh, using what is called the Kiley transform. So it's a complex transform that maps real numbers to the unit circle. We'll be applying it to the Laplacian, to the Laplacian spectrum. So it maps all non-negative numbers to 
uh, complex half circle, and we can scale it by parameter h that will basically zoom in and out in the desired frequency band. So here we are interested in these red eigenvalues. We'll see that, that by increasing this uh, parameter h that we call spectral zoom, we can focus on the lower frequency band, frequency band that separates between different, uh, uh, different communities on the graph. And uh, we can take powers of this Kali transform, uh, what is called the Kali polynomial. Uh, basically, it's a rational function with learnable parameters. So similar to polynomial filters, it just has matrix inversions. Uh, again, order of one parameters per layer. If you compute matrix inversion uh, directly, then it has cubic complexity. You can approximate it using your favorite uh, iterative eigensolver, for example, a few Jacobi iterations. So then we are back to linear complexity, maybe with higher constant. And uh, these filters also, uh, if they're not compactly supported, they decay exponentially. So they're also localized. Okay, and here's an example. So these are uh, polynomial filters of degree three. So you can see that exactly the support is exactly three hops. This is uh, polynomial filters of uh, degree 7. They, they, they have support of 7 hops. And these are the rational filters of, uh, of order 3. So they uh, can be both local and non-local. Okay. And they decay, uh, decay exponentially. And if you look at this uh, example of uh, community detection, these filters actually perform much better. They are able to localize uh, the frequencies much better, and uh, as a result, the accuracy of community detection is much higher. Uh, and here is a, a plot showing the computational complexity versus the size of the graph. So you can see that it scales linearly as expected, even though with slightly higher constant. Okay, so let's again look at uh, our graph filters. Let's try to make things slightly simpler. So this, is, this was polynomial filter of degree r, right? So basically we multiplied our signal by, by some powers of the L plus n and summed everything up with learnable coefficients, right? Let's look at polynomial of degree one, right? So basically it has uh, the zero power component that basically takes the signal itself, applies to it the power zero of the L plus n, essentially identity matrix, uh, plus some uh, multiplication of the signal by uh, uh, by the L plus n, right? And if I plug in uh, the expression for the L plus n, in this case it's the normalized symmetric L plus n, I get something like this, right? So basically I'm uh, diffusing uh, uh, the signal with this matrix. And you can see basically it has two parts. Why it's not switching? So basically you can think of it as uh, basically the, diffu the, the diffusion part. So I take my signal and I diffuse uh, it on the graph. Right, by applying this, uh, this uh, uh, symmetrized diffusion matrix. And I also have a skip connection, right? So I, uh, I keep the signal as is, the original vector, right? And uh, basically we have uh, two coefficients that, that uh, combine these, uh, these two signals. Uh, so this is a work of uh, Keith and Welling that uh, basically that offer this interpretation. They actually uh, merge this part into a single matrix that I denote here by uh, w wave, and if we have vector valued features on the vertices, we can linearly transform these uh, them by, by this matrix that I denote theta, right? So overall, we have n by d uh, vertex feature matrix, right? n is the number of vertices, d is the dimensionality of the, uh, of the, of the vertex features. I first linearly transform them by the matrix theta, and then I diffuse them by the matrix uh, uh, w wave, right? And I get a new set of features on the, on the vertices of the graph. Okay, so that's probably the simplest model of convolution that you can think of, right? So it has uh, this linear feature transformation and diffusion, right? So the diffusion is done by a fixed matrix, right? You can make it learnable as we've seen before, but in the simplest case, it's just fixed diffusion matrix. And you can uh, combine it in multiple layers. So you can uh, do as uh, classical convolutional neural networks, you can do one layer of this linear transformation and diffusion, followed by non-linearity such as ReLU, then repeat it again and again and again. Okay, and this gives you a graph neural network that will produce at the end some, uh, 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 some kind of uh, vertex features. You can take uh, the last layer to have a, a softmax, so you will be able to classify each vertex. For example, if you want to 
let's say, in case of binary classification, you can predict whether, let's say, a user of a social network voted for Trump or Hillary Clinton. Okay? So here's an example. It's a citation network uh, called Cora. So if you think of MNIST, that's the toy example for images, Cora is toy example uh, for graphs. So uh, it has, uh, the vertices represent uh, papers, scientific uh, articles. Uh, the feature vectors are bags of words, basically the occurrence of certain terms in, in the abstract of the paper. And the graph represents citations. So usually it is supposed to be a directed graph. In this case, to make things simple, we make it undirected. So if the papers are related by citation, whether paper I cites paper J or vice versa. Okay? So uh, usually it is, uh, it is used in transductive setting, meaning that we know the labels of some of the vertices. We try to interpolate to predict the labels of the other vertices, okay? And you can see that this GCN, Graph Convolutional Network, performs uh, pretty nicely, much better than other methods on this data set. I should say that you should take it with a grain of salt because uh, Cora is like MNIST. It's not very representative. It's actually quite simple benchmark and a method that works well on Cora might not work well on more complicated settings. But at least it gives you an idea. It's good to, to start uh, your new model from, uh, from this to example, maybe. Okay? So if you want to simplify things even further, you can think of uh, basically linearizing, removing the nonlinearities. And in this case, basically, let's say that my sigma is just an identity function. I will get something like this, right? So I will get a power of the diffusion matrix, right? So I apply W uh, to the power L. Is it very disturbing? Turn it off. Turn off. Right. Is breaking. No, no, no. Sa yep. Sound is good, right? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Well, thank you. Much better. Yeah. So, uh, any questions? No. Ah, uh, what a relief. <laughs> I already got used to it. Okay, so uh, basically you get uh, a power L of this uh, diffusion matrix W and a linear transformation of the features where uh, basically there is no need uh, to keep all these uh, linear transformations from multiple layers because it's just a product of matrices. These are learnable parameters, so you just combine them into a single matrix, right? So that would be uh, the simplest uh, graph convolution. In fact, the paper calls it simple graph convolution, so S. Uh, GC for short. So the only uh, thing that changes is that you basically have a power of the diffusion matrix instead of the, the simple diffusion matrix. Okay? And you can think of it as a kind of uh, linear regression. So there is this joke about machine learning and uh, essentially that if you remove the mask of machine learning, you will see that it's uh, linear regression that is uh, applied uh, or logistic regression applied to, to applied to, to data at large scale. So here we can do the same thing, right? You can uh, think of the diffusion as uh, some fixed feature extraction and then logistic regression, right? If, and then we have softmax, for example. So that's uh, the, probably the, the, the baseline, the equivalent of logistic regression for graphs. And in some cases, it would actually work uh, quite nicely. Uh, so, well, it's uh, basically if you linearize uh, the uh, multi-layer graph uh, convolutional neural network, uh, the uh, product of the uh, diffusion matrices gives you W to the power L, and the product of uh, the, uh, of the uh, linear transformation matrices, because these are learnable parameters, you can, uh, you can aggregate them into a single matrix. Right? So, basically, they are, uh, it, it, it's equivalent to, to having a single matrix of learnable parameters. They are redundant. Okay, that's, uh, that's what you get here. And uh, they show that uh, apparently in some situations it works remarkably well. So that would probably be the easiest starting point if you want to do, uh, if you want to do deep learning on graphs. You see that actually there is nothing deep about it. It's basically logistic regression. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, slightly more complicated uh, construction. So basically what you see here essentially uh, if you think of these convolution type operations on graphs, what we've seen so far is uh, linear operations, right? So you start with some uh, vertex wise features that you can model as this matrix F, right? Or whether linearly transformed or not. And then you multiply them by some matrix, right? Diffusion matrix, Laplacian, 
uh, whatever, right? You can make it more complicated. You can actually make this uh, diffusion matrix itself still a linear operator, but dependent on the features, right? So this A will be computed based on F itself. We'll see a few models. Probably the most popular one is graph attention networks. And uh, finally, you can make the whole uh, process nonlinear. So uh, if you think of message passing neural networks or uh, the work that we did with Justin on point clouds, the edge convolution, they would fall into this, uh, into this category. So you cannot think of it anymore as a, a matrix vector product. It will be something slightly more complicated. Okay. So before we proceed to these uh, uh, nonlinear methods, uh, let's say a few words about pooling. So in convolutional neural networks, we have essentially two basic building blocks. One is convolution. So I hope that by now you are able to do convolutions on graphs. And the second uh, component is pooling. So pooling is not always used. It depends on the application. But in applications such as image recognition, you want to pull your local features into a single vector that represents the image. Same thing if you want to classify the entire graph you may want to pull your features from vertices into a single vector, right? And uh, that's where it comes. So uh, pooling is uh, pretty straightforward on graphs. You essentially you want to reduce the size of the graph and uh, aggregate the features on the vertices. So one way of doing it is you take pairs of vertices that are connected by an edge and you collapse them. So they become a single vertex and then you combine uh, the values of the, the basically the, the, the feature vectors in these vertices, let's say using the maximum operation element-wise, right? That will be the simplest recipe for, uh, for pooling. So essentially you have a process that produces uh, a coarsening of the graph. There are many ways of doing it. Let's say the Gracklos algorithm. So it will have, uh, you will have a sequence of graphs with corresponding adjacency matrices. And then you have uh, a pooling process that produces the respective uh, feature vectors, usually by some uh, operations such as maximum or average. Okay, and you can interleave the convolutional and the pooling layers, so the typical architecture will look like this. Yeah. So the two three node is connected to. Let me see. Uh, so the four and five, uh, then you have the six and seven. Um, well, these are the edges that remain, right? So if there is an edge, you usually keep it. So this is just one way of doing it. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it should appear. You're right. Yeah. There should be an edge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a mistake here. Yeah, so there should be an edge between three and seven. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, for this comment. So uh, this is how the uh, typical architecture will look like. So you start with a fine graph, then you progressively coarsen it, and uh, between the coarsening, you may apply at least one layer of uh, graph convolution, and at the end you arrive uh, at a fixed vector that uh, describes your graph, uh, the data on this graph. Okay. Now what is interesting that uh, in images uh, pooling is a very uh, Boring operation. Yeah, question? Of course, yeah. So the question is basically what is the right way of pulling, uh, uh, basically of, uh, of coarsening the graph? It definitely affects the results. So, and uh, basically that's exactly what I started saying. In images, the coarsening operation is very boring. Basically, you just subsample your grid and then you you uh, you, you aggregate uh, your pixels usually using a maximum. On graphs, there is a, a, a plethora of way of doing it, and actually, you can make it learnable. So, uh, in learnable pooling, basically, you have uh, two graph neural networks. That one is producing the features, another one is producing the assignment matrix that basically clusters the nodes together. So you have uh, the next graph will be of size n l plus one, right? You start with at the current layer the, the, the graph size is n sub index l. The next layer coarser level will be n uh, sub index l plus one. So the matrix S represents this mapping from the fine graph to the coarse graph. You also learn it with uh, with the graph neural network. Uh, 
and then you apply it to produce the uh, feature coarsening and the adjacency matrix coarsening, right? So that will be basically, that will be uh, the most general uh, uh, pooling operation and these matrices are learned. Unfortunately, well, in the ideal world, you, you want to learn it end to end. Uh, basically, it should be supervised by the by the, the loss of the task that you're solving, right? Let's say vertex-wise classification. Usually, the signal is not sufficient, so uh, the gradient is is, uh, uh, is very is very small. Uh, it works better if you augment your loss function with some auxiliary loss. So, in this paper uh, from the group of Yuri Lesko, it's from Stanford. They used the link prediction loss, so basically the difference between W, the adjacency matrix, and S S transpose. And row-wise entropy, basically to make uh, to make uh, distinct uh, clusters, and uh, a better approach was uh, proposed by by the group of uh, Cesare Alipi from Lugano. They used uh, uh, mean cut loss plus uh, orthogonality on the uh, or, or on these uh, assignment matrices. So basically, this way you can uh, make learnable pooling. Okay, let's talk a little bit about directed graphs. So uh, we've seen so far that our graphs were undirected, so that uh, the spectral construction can work. Uh, let's see a few words. Say a few words about directed graphs. You will see in the following that actually it's not such a big deal if we depart from the spectral constructions. We can actually uh, easily handle uh, any kind of graphs. Okay. So dealing with directed graphs, this is a directed graph, right? So it has edges that can point from i to j, but not necessarily from j to i. And this is how the adjacency matrix looks like. It is not necessarily symmetric, right? So the Laplacian is not necessarily symmetric. It doesn't have orthogonal eigenvectors. So if in the previous uh, construction, that might be a problem. Right? We cannot have orthogonal eigenvectors. So one way of dealing with these graphs is actually convert them into undirected but differently weighted graphs. Okay? And one way of doing it is looking at subgraph structures, what is called motifs or graphlets. Basically, I can look at, uh, in this case, of substructures of graphs of size uh, uh, of uh, three vertices. And in directed graphs, there are uh, 13 such motifs. So for a given motif, I can count how many times an edge participates in this motif. Right? You can see, for example, the edge 1, 2 participates three times in motif M7. Right? Basically, it, it is shared by these three triangles. And for example, edge 8, 9 participates twice. Right? And uh, maybe age uh, uh, six seven participates only once, right? So basically, if I capture this in uh, in adjacency matrix, I get a weighted undirected graph, right? And basically, I can do it for all the possible motifs. So it gives me uh, motif Laplacians. So for each motif, I have a different Laplacian. So you can think of it as a kind of way of uh, anisotropically spreading information, right? If I think of adjacency matrix or diffusion matrix or Laplacian matrix as a way of propagating information on the graph, so this way I can propagate information uh, in direction of certain structures, right? So information will flow faster in certain ways. Now these motifs here are more or less arbitrary construction, but in, depending on the application they actually might have certain meaning. So if you think of uh, another transportation networks, Let's say motif number nine, for example, represents a hub, right? So traffic flows through some airport, let's say, right? Or in citation networks, for example, motifs eight and motifs 10 might have different meaning. One, for example, will be a very popular, a very well-cited paper. And another one can be a review paper that uh, in its turn cites many other papers, right? So, and you can think of more complicated constructions, maybe involving uh, higher order structures with more vertices. This is, for example, very common in biological networks. They are actually pretty, pretty clearly defined, defined motifs. Okay, so we can use this Laplacian uh, again to uh, define uh, polynomial filters. In this case, this will be multivariate polynomials that will be applied to uh, multiple Laplacians, and the product of these Laplacians will usually be uh, uh, non-commutative. So it matters how we apply them. Right. So I can apply for first multiply by delta 1 and then by delta 2, or the other way around. First by delta 2, then by delta 1, the result will be different. So in this polynomial, we'll need to account for all these possible orders. So And the number of coefficients, the number of all the possible combinations is actually very high. So it is order of 1 still, it's independent on n, but this, uh, if k is sufficiently large, like in our case 13, and the degree of the polynomial even modest like 2 or 3, 
this number will be will be very high. So in practice, we may want to define something like recursive polynomials. So I will not uh, I will not get into details. Basically, you make the coefficients dependent. Okay, and basically we inherit all the good properties from the previously defined polynomial filters. Bottom line, basically this is uh, kind of direction sensitive filters on graphs. Uh, you can apply it to directed uh, graphs. This is directed version of Cora. You get uh, quite significantly better performance. Now there is some pre-computation cost to compute these uh, uh, motifs and their uh, the respective adjacency matrices, but if you can uh, if you can handle these costs, these are local operations, so it might work better. Okay, let's talk about an application that involves uh, graph products, and the motivation is problems of uh, uh, from the domain of recommender systems. And let me give you an example. So uh, think of Netflix. So Netflix has uh, probably something like tens of millions of users and probably hundreds of thousands of uh, movie titles. They want to recommend movies to users, right? So if you think of a user uh, giving a score to a movie that he or she watched, let's say from uh, between one and five, we can represent it as a very large matrix, right? That most of it, uh, most of its entries will be unknown. Right? Uh, even if I am watching Netflix movies continuously, probably the entire lifetime is not sufficient to see all of them. So it will be just sparsely sampled. And our goal is to recover all the rest of the values. So this is called matrix completion. And basically once I do matrix completion, I can recommend movies to users. I can tell, for example, what are the, uh, the highest scored movies that, that I was able to reconstruct. Right? So usually it's formulated as an algebraic problem. We, we are given some scores. We try to fit the matrix with the lowest rank, basically the smallest number of linearly dependent columns or rows that explain the data. Right? So it's a kind of low dimensional model for matrices. It is NP hard, so the, basically the breakthrough in compressed sensing works of Emmanuel Candes and co-authors uh, basically brought this uh, convex relaxation uh, of minimization of the of the rank, uh, replacing it by nuclear norm, the sum of the singular values of the matrix, and showing that the solution of this problem under some technical conditions is equivalent to the original NP hard problem. Yeah, the constraints are replaced by uh, by penalty, so this is the typical problem that you solve. Okay, all here is. Uh, omega is an indicator function, basically indicator of the of the known elements, right? So the problem with this uh, formulation is that uh, it doesn't account for structure at all. So if, uh, for example, I shuffle the rows and the columns, I will not change the algebraic properties of the matrix. If I add a new user, this is called cold start problem. If a new user comes to Netflix and has never seen any movie, I cannot uh, interpolate in any meaningful way. Uh, uh, the information for this user, right? So we want to add some structure, and this structure can be added, at least in the most simplistic sense, in the form of a graph. Let's say that uh, I have a social network of users, and we assume uh, uh, homophilic relations, meaning that uh, users that are connected by an edge, basically friends, have similar tastes. So now we can talk about smoothness, right? So basically it's a signal that is defined on the user graph. The columns of this matrix are uh, basically, our uh, edge, uh, sorry, our um, vertex features on this graph, right? So I can say that this vector should rise smoothly when I move to one user to another user uh, along the edge, right? So and if the user are not connected by an edge, then maybe the vectors can be different, right? So we can formulate it in the form of Dirichlet energy, as we've seen before, basically using the graph of Plasen that uh, measures how smooth these uh, the uh, the matrix is column-wise with respect to the user graph. And we can do the same thing for the movies. Basically, we can define some similarity between movies and uh, uh, basically uh, also define row-wise smoothness of these metrics with respect to the movie graph, right? So now, basically, we have this score matrix that lives on the Cartesian product of the user and the movie graphs, right? And now it has structure. So it's a product of, uh, of two graphs is the domain on which, on which this matrix lives. In practical applications, if you look at this optimization problem, it has huge number of variables, right? If you have, I don't know, 10 million users and a million movies, uh, the uh, number of variables here is humongous. So it is common to, f to factorize uh, the matrix. Uh, 
basically it's represented as product of rho and column factors, basically slim matrices, so the matrices of uh, fixed rank, and uh, you can apply this regularization separately to each of these, uh, to each of these factors, to so the factor W and factor H. Okay, so it works in exactly the same way. Now, basically what we would like to do is to replace these low pass filters, basically the uh, the initial energy that promotes smooth uh, 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 signals, row-wise and column-wise, we want to replace it with some optimal learned filters. So we want to, to learn a filter that produces the best result for this problem. And the question here is, what is the analogy of a two-dimensional convolution on graphs in this setting? Okay. So we've seen how the one-dimensional convolution is defined, what is two-dimensional convolution? So how do we do two-dimensional convolution for images? It is pretty simple, right? We take an image, the, here denoted by X, we compute the Fourier transform, uh, basically by multiplying it uh, column-wise, right? So we compute the column-wise Fourier transform, multiplied by the Fourier matrix from the right, we compute uh, the row-wise Fourier transform of the column-wise Fourier transform. This gives us the two-dimensional Fourier transform. So if you w wish to write it as, uh, basically if you want to column stack your image into a long vector, you can write this uh, operation as a Kronecker product of phi and phi transpose, right? So you get a huge matrix that will have uh, this tensor product structure. That's why we can talk about two-dimensional frequencies, right? We have horizontal and vertical frequencies. So we can do the same thing for our score matrices, but we replace this phi and phi transpose by the eigenvectors of the respective graph Laplacians. So we have the eigenvectors of the graph of the column and the row graph of the user in the movie graph, and this is multi-graph Fourier transform, right? We multiply X, our score matrix, by phi R from the left, phi R transpose, and phi C from the right, okay? Convolution is defined in exactly in the same way as, uh, as element-wise product in the, uh, uh, in, uh, of the Fourier transforms, and then the inverse Fourier transform, okay? And we can define polynomial filters exactly as we've seen before. It will be multiplying from the left and from the right by the respective Laplacians taken to some power. And we see combinations of all powers weighted by, uh, by respective coefficients that are denoted here by theta j and j prime. With two indices. And basically this uh, gives us the analogy of uh, two-dimensional filters, which are basically row-wise frequencies and column-wise frequencies. And this is how an example of how these filters may look like. Okay. So basically, we can use this construction to extract uh, uh, spatial features from the matrix. We can feed them into, uh, then into recurrent neural network that produces a sequence of incremental updates of the matrix. Let's say score, changing the score by plus or minus one every time. And we can repeat this process multiple times. So the best way of thinking of it is a kind of learnable diffusion operation. So you start with some given scores, all the rest are unknown. You try to propagate these scores uh, on this product of graphs. Uh, by a diffusion process with learnable parameters. What is important to observe here that the number of parameters is independent on the matrix size. So the parameters here are just coefficients of the filter and maybe coefficients of this recurrent neural network. Okay? So basically, that's the big difference from the, uh, from the let's say, standard classical formulation of, uh, uh, of matrix completion problems where the complexity is at least linear in the largest dimension of the matrix. And here you can see an example of uh, uh, a synthetic matrix. Uh, the, basically, the blue represents the unknown values. We start with this matrix. Uh, it has very high root mean square error. Uh, the, uh, the score here is between between one and uh, between zero and five. And after a few uh, instances of this process, you see that the error drops almost to zero, and we get almost perfect reconstruction of of the matrix. And here are some examples. So the paper is about two, more than two years old. So this is probably not state of the art, but at that point we got some state of the art results on standard uh, uh, benchmarks that are used in matrix completion. Uh, let's now talk in the remaining time a little bit about spatial convolution on graphs. Basically we've seen this uh, uh, so far, uh, we've been doing essentially linear filters on the graph. We can do something better. We can make it's still linear, but dependent on the data, or can do it completely non-linear. So we've seen basically our starting point was uh, the spectral construction, right? We, we, start, we defined convolution by analogy 
to the property of the Fourier transform that is called the convolution theorem that uh, basically uh, generalizes this idea of having a product in the uh, in the Fourier domain. So uh, the Fourier transform is replaced by multiplication by the by the graph Laplacian eigenvectors, and uh, uh, that's uh, that was our uh, starting point for the convolution. We know though that uh, we can think of convolution as a kind of sliding window operation, right? So if I think of an image, I extract a block of pixels, I multiply them by some filter, I sum them up, right? That will be the result of the filter at a point. I can then move to a new location, right? And what is important because of shift invariance or shift equivariance, the very operation of extracting the pitch, the block of pixels will be exactly the same. The pixels might be different and the result of the convolution might also be different, but the process of extracting the pitch uh, looks identical, right? On a non-Euclidean space like manifold or graph, uh, the extraction of the pitch has to be uh, thought of again. Basically, you need to define what, what you mean by this, right? Because in an image, even the number of neighbors is fixed, right? I, if I look around, let's say ignore the boundaries, if I look around the pixel, I will always find exactly the same connectivity, exactly the same number of neighbors. In a graph, it's not true. In a social network, for example, some vertices might have very high degree, very popular users have a lot of neighbors and some others maybe very lonely and, and have uh, just a few friends. So on, uh, on the manifold and surface, as we'll see, uh, as we'll see tomorrow, uh, we also have, uh, because of curvature, uh, basically we also need to define something that, that uh, accounts correctly for the, uh, the non-flatness of, uh, of the surface. Okay, so one simple construction is the following. Basically, we define a local system of coordinates, or actually pseudo-coordinates, they don't need to be one-to-one, -one, around the vertex. So I will denote it by U with subindex I and J. So basically, each uh, vertex in the neighborhood of I will be attached some uh, vector of coordinates that I denote by U. And for example, it can be any graph theoretical thing. Uh, it can be, for example, the degree, the geodesic distance from the central vertex, and so on and so forth. And in this system of coordinates, we define a set of weighting functions, let's say J weighting functions. Uh, so you can think of them as a kind of generalized pixels. So they will be local around the vertex I, basically in that system of coordinates, and they will be uh, blending the, uh, uh, my Fisher vectors in the, in the surrounding vertices. So I can write spatial convolution in this form. Basically, it will be sum of uh, these uh, local averages. We call this the patch operator multiplied by the values of the filter G, right? So again, think of this extraction of a patch of pixels, multiplying it by, by a template, by a mask, and summing up. That's exactly what is written here, right? What, basically, the, the, what is called here the page operator is these generalized soft pixels, okay? And you can also see that, for example, if we choose these weighting functions to be Gaussians, we can learn them, so they are parametric functions, we can learn these soft weights, and we can also exchange the order uh, of the summations, and you will easily see that this is a mixture of Gaussians. So that's why this architecture is called uh, MONET, uh, Mixture Model Network. Okay, so here the learnable parameters are, are the, uh, basically the, 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 the filter coefficients, G, right? That's the magnitude of each Gaussian, and the, uh, the covariance and uh, matrix and the mean vector, sigma and, and mu. Okay, so let's see an example. You haven't seen MNIST for quite some time. So uh, to make it more interesting, let's think of MNIST as a graph learning problem. So you can think of it in two different ways, basically as a regular grid of pixels, right? So we have a graph with some fixed connectivity, right? Or it can be irregular grid of super pixels. We do some over segmentation of the image and uh, we have super pixels that are connected. Let's say adjacent super pixels are connected. So here the difference is that the, in the first case, the graph is fixed. So what changes is only the signal on the graph, right? Every g digit basically will be different signals living on the same graph. In the second case, the graph will also change. So every digit comes with its own graph, right? And uh, this is a more interesting situation. That's actually where we want our filters to generalize well. And uh, in the first case, we can obviously compare to classical convolutional neural network architectures like Leonet 5, right? So that's the seminal paper of Jan Likon. You can see that uh, uh, we get almost perfect 
recognition of the digits. In the second case, where we have the irregular grid, we obviously cannot apply the classical CNN, right, because it works only on grids. Uh, you can see that if we apply the spectral uh, neural network, we get pretty poor performance. And uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the underlying graph changes, so it's, it doesn't generalize well. And uh, basically, if we use uh, the construction that I showed before, uh, the Monet architecture, it uh, it will uh, uh, the, the the performance will almost not degrade. Now, graph attention networks I mentioned before. Basically, you can think of it as a particular example of the Monet architecture. Basically, here the uh, the weights for the neighborhood average are taken from the fissure itself. Basically, you can think of it as, as attention weights that are attached to each of the neighbors, and they are computed in this way, basically through some learnable transformation. So that's how we aggregate uh, uh, aggregate the fissures. We learn the, the the way to aggregate it based on the fissures themselves. So you can think of it as a monet architecture where the local coordinates are produced from the fissures themselves. Okay, and you can take it even further. Basically, you can, the, the, this is probably the most general architecture. Uh, in this situation, you have uh, uh, vertex features. You might also have edge features, right? Represent them as matrices F and E. And we have a parametric uh, edge function that takes a triplet of basically a pair of uh, vertices connected by an edge, uh, the uh, edge features and the respective uh, vertex features, and uh, applies to them some parametric function. We have some local permutation invariant aggregation operation that basically takes these edge features that are produced by this function and aggregates them. So usually this will be, again, average or maximum, but it can be also something learnable. Okay? And this will be the new feature for the, for the node. And basically you can think of it as a learnable local operator, nonlinear operator. Right? So remember these three different types of uh, uh, graph convolutions, fixed matrix, uh, basically linear diffusion, uh, a, a, a matrix that multiplies uh, your feature vectors, but the matrix itself depending on the feature vectors, and uh, the most general case of nonlinear operator. Okay, and you can see that uh, many of the previous models that we've seen before can actually be thought of as particular instances. You can realize them by choosing the appropriate edge feature and aggregation function. Okay, I believe I will stop here because I want to talk about applications, but uh, I have only five minutes left, so I will uh, leave it for tomorrow. So I will uh, talk tomorrow. I will start with different applications, then we'll talk about manifolds and applications in vision and graphics. Okay, thank you very much.